so pay drivers. Love them or hate them. No, let's be honest, we, we just hate them. Over the years then, we've seen some that are good, some that are bad, and some that are downright awful. Anyway, it's no lie that the number of drivers paying for their F1 seats has frankly skyrocketed in recent years, but in fact, pay drivers have been in F1 practically since its inception, with Frank Williams racing cars employing 10 drivers over the course of 1975, then repeating that the year after. Arguably no different to nowadays then. But things would change in 2001 as young Malaysian driver Alex Jung entered the sport and was about as out of his depth as me sitting my engineering exams having done bugger all revision this lockdown. <laughs> End me now please. But that aside, let's take a look at the life and career of Alex Jung, F1's first modern pay driver. Jung was born in Kuala Lumpur in 1976, and at an early age he would watch his father begin racing and his mother start a career in rallying. During this time, Jung would also start gaining an interest in Formula 1 and set about making his dream of an F1 career a reality. Jung would follow in his father's footsteps and start racing saloon cars in 1992, and, in fairness, he wasn't half bad. Jung would win two races in his first season and take a few pole positions along the way, before switching to Formula Racing in 1994. Our boy Alex would then start racing in Formula Asia, where his good form would frankly continue, taking a one win in his rookie season before going on to finish second in the championship in 1995 with eight wins. So that's good, isn't it? Well, though the Formula Asia Championship has fielded some F1 talents in the past, with the likes of Karun Chandok and Takuma Sato beginning their respective careers there, 1995 was a bit... Yeah. The only real driver of note was the cucumber himself, Narayne Carthacane, and if you've not seen my video on HRT showing off his dismal season over there, then just know he wasn't one of F1's brightest stars. Either way, you would graduate to the Formula Renault for the 1996 season. Backed by Malaysian tyre supplier Silverstone Tyres, you would land a seat with the Startline Racing Team. Our boy Alex would have a fairly positive first season with a few top six finishes, though he was never really a contender for the championship. Sticking with Startline for 1997, Jung's second year in Formula Renault would prove about as fruitful as the relationship between Azila Rabitbull and Christian Horner. Not helped by a poor car that year, Jung would fall towards the back of the pack and finish outside the top of the 10 by the end of the season. But onwards and upwards, right? Jung stepped up to Formula 3 at the back end of 1997 with Portman Racing. His performances that year were a bit lacklustre, but in fairness to him, he was joining the established championship mid-season. Alex would stick with Portman for the first half of 1998, achieving some meh, but consistent results. You did prove, however, that he was good at quickly adapting to a new car. How, after switching to Alan Docking racing for the final three rounds of the season, he'd still get the consistent results in the lower half of the top 10 he was getting before. But, as I said, these results weren't really setting the world alight, with Yu ending the 1998 season 13th in the standings. And before the 1999 F3 season could get underway, Yu found himself sponsorless, and his father even having to go into debt just to keep his career alive. Despite this and the fact that Yun only contested five rounds of the championship the next year, our boy was still able to improve his championship position, finishing 11th, and not too bad. And he was even able to sneak a podium at Brands Hatch. This, however, was about as good as it got for our boy here. After a fairly disappointing campaign in Formula 3000, populated by collisions, driver errors, and mechanical failures, Yu would find himself testing and later racing for Team Le Mans in Formula Nippon in 2000. Yu would start his season by crashing his car during qualifying in Suzuka, meaning he'd be unable to even start the race. Alex then retired from the following two races, one of which in spectacular fashion when he stalled on the starting grid and caused a multi-car pile-up before the cars could even reach turn one. So, at this point, what Alex Hume really needed was just some meaningful advice, and his team manager was about to give it to him, in the form of, and I quote, he needs to calm down and finish races. Ha <laughs> no shit. Hume would end up finishing races, but only four of them, and when he did, they were fairly unimpressive. Either way, Jung would still stick with Team Le Mans for 2001. Alex would contest six rounds with the team, though he only finished four of these, and again, the results weren't particularly impressive. So let's just take a minute then just to recap what we've got so far. We've got a guy who started off pretty good in saloon racing, but by the time he's racing with the pros in the form of the cars, he was about as impressive as Haas F1 sponsorship choices. So where's the next logical step for this guy? Well, obviously. It's got to be Formula 1, right? Yeah, you can tell how well this is going to go, can't you? Midway through the 2001 season, Yoon was able to acquire state-sponsored funding from the Magnum Corporation. Now look, I appreciate that most sport hadn't really taken off in Malaysia at this point, but was this really the best you could do? Like, come come on, guys. Yoon would be approached by longtime backmarkers Minardi about a seat, 
and Alex and Tesla car in Magello not long after. Now, though the real financial figure behind this was never disclosed to the public, it was estimated to be, and hold on to your hats here, about five million dollars. Now, in today's money, that's more like seven and a half million dollars, and to put that money into an F1 context for you, it's the sort of money you could use to employ Lando Norris, Daniel Kvyat, Pierre Gasly, and Antonio Giovinazzi all at once, with money to spare. Interestingly, it's also the same amount of money has paid Roman Grosjean, which is obviously money well spent then. Anyway, Yoon would eventually make his F1 appearance at the 2001 Italian GP, replacing equally forgettable racer Tarso Marquez. Now, with just three rounds left in the season, you wouldn't really expect much from the young rookie, maybe to get within a second of his teammate and bring the car home in one piece. As you can imagine, neither of those really happened. Yoon would qualify dead last for his first appearance with Bernardi in Italy, 5.2 seconds lower than pole sitter Juan Pablo Montoya, and then well over a second slower than teammate Fernando Alonso. Alex would end up running about as high as 15th in the race, but was forced into retirement before the end. The next race in Indianapolis would be even worse, with Yoon starting again at the back of the grid, this time five positions and 1.3 seconds behind Alonso. Yoon would yet again retire, however, for running for just 38 laps. The last race of the season would be at Suzuka, a track that Alex Yoon knew well, so yeah, maybe he could challenge Alonso a little better here. Eh, not really. Qualifying would see you take up his typical spot of 20 seconds and last, two seconds behind teammate Alonso. This time though our boy would finish the race, just three laps down and the last running car however. So as far as debuts go, you wasn't really standing out as the next Michael Schumacher, maybe more the next Ricardo Rosset or Taki Noe. He wasn't quick, he wasn't showing many signs of improvement, and was still unable to show he could even consistently finish races. Nevertheless, and to the surprise of pretty much everyone in the paddock, Yoon was signed to Minardi again for the full 2002 season. Yoon would also get a new teammate in the form of rookie Australian Mark Webber. Alex would find himself actually beating someone in qualifying, lining up 21st on the grid for the first run in Melbourne. Though it should be noted that the driver he beat Takuma Sato set a time 27 seconds slower than pole, so either something was up there, or perhaps Andrea Moda got a hold of his Jordan car that weekend. In what was a chaotic opening race for the season, you would actually go on to finish and just miss out the points as well with a P7. However, he was still outclassed by his rookie teammate Weber, who went on to score his first points with P5. To make matters worse, this would be his best result of the season. Yu would retire yet again in Malaysia and then finish 13th in Brazil, before failing to qualify for round 4 in San Marino a feat he'd repeat later on the season at Silverstone in Germany. And if you think it couldn't get any worse, it was about to. Jung entered round five of the season in Spain with a scintillating zero points. During practice and qualifying, both Jung and Weber would scuffer scary front and rear wing failures, so many in fact that the team didn't even have enough parts to even race. After a further two retirements in Austria and Monaco, the rumours were starting to circulate that Minardi might replace Jung with someone like Alonso, who was currently sitting a year out of F1 acting as Renault's test and reserve driver. The team eventually decided it might be best to take Jung out of the car for a couple of races, citing that he needed some extra preparation for the rest of the season. Look, look, I'm, I'm sorry, if your driver is so out of his depth that he needs to take a break just to prepare for the rest of the campaign, then... Man, what are you doing in F1? Either way, you would return to race for the team in the last three Grand Prix of the 2002 season. But if he thought his preparation was going to do him any good, oh, let's be honest here, no one thought that. Jung would retire from two of the three races, and the one that he did finish, he was six laps behind the leader and five laps behind the next closest car in Italy. Rather unsurprisingly, our boy wouldn't be retained for the 2003 season, and Jung's F1 career was sadly over. And just recapping his stats, it really sort of shows why. Yoon would start 18 Grand Prix, but only finished six of them, taking home no wins, no podiums, no fastest laps, and oddly enough, no points. His best qualifying position was 19th, a 2002 French GP, and even then it was the last spot on the grid as all the other drivers didn't qualify. In fact, it's almost amazing Yoon was able to come back for the last three rounds of that season. Like, why didn't Minardi just place Alonso in that car? I, I, I just never know. Oh, hang on. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I'm an idiot. There is, however, and in, in a very rare scenario, a happy end to this story. You would actually go on to have a fairly successful career after his endeavour in Formula 1. Like, I'm not even kidding, this guy raced in pretty much everything. Champ Car, Porsche Carrera Cup, V8 Supercars, A1 GP, GP2, the list just goes on and on. You would then really find his form at the Audi R8 LMS Cup, winning the championship three years in a row from 2014 to 2016. 
So, hey, sometimes I guess these things can work out for these guys sometimes. But if you did enjoy the video, make sure you do leave a like, subscribe, and let me know who else you want me to cover it next in the comments. Also, I've started using my Twitter a little bit more recently, so at WillL2000, if you want to follow me, there'll be a link down in the description below. But yeah, with all those shameless plugs out the way, hope you have a lovely rest of your week, and I'll catch you in the next one.